political. But whatever the outcome of today's talks, has the government made a mess of the Brexit negotiations so far? To discuss that, I'm joined by Caroline Flint, Labour's former Europe Minister, and the Conservative MP, Chris Phil. Welcome to you both. I mean, just in terms of the negotiation, I mean, we know that you backed the government's mm. uh, withdrawal bill. On the other hand, you didn't mm. think Brexit was a good idea in the first place. Mm. How well do you think it's been handled? Well, I think if we were only looking at the front of house operations, Adam, we'd be thinking, my God, it's been absolutely shambolic. From the soundings that we're hearing this morning before the lunchtime meeting, it, it does appear, I'm looking for a bit of wood to touch here, um, to say that things seem to be progressing. So maybe their behind the scenes negotiations have been better than what has been front of house. But you can hardly blame politicians and the public for being concerned about the state of the negotiations, given the shambles we've had and the infighting we've had across the Conservative benches over the last few weeks if not months. I mean, what would you point to as, as a shambles? Oh, well, I think, you know, the sort of uh, uh, the changes of view amongst between David Davis and, and Boris Johnson, the, uh, the letter from Michael Gove and Boris Johnson. I mean, the really, you know, you know, in the front, stabbing in the front of the Prime Minister every time she's made, tried to make headway. And let's not forget, in the last week, we've had, what was it, seven more red lines put down by the most ardent leavers to say, unless you meet these red lines, Prime Minister, uh, we will not support you. I think all of that has added to public concern, which I don't think has changed about leaving the European Union, but public concern about the management of the whole negotiations. A bit of a shambles, isn't it? No, I don't accept that. Look, a bit of healthy debate is no bad thing. And the letter that Caroline just referred to really is no different to the Prime Minister's own Lancaster House speech a few months ago. But what matters isn't the Westminster tittle-tattle and who said what to who and who wrote what letter. It's the substance of the negotiations. And I am hopeful, although far from certain, that we are going to see some progress today and that those three key areas um, get, broadly speaking, agreed so we can move on to the trade discussions. But, but it does look as if, um, you know, really there are two pressures uh, buffeting the Prime Minister about. One is what the Europeans uh, consider acceptable, but the other is her colleagues on the right of the party, the Brexiteers, who want to harden the stance. I mean, there was no reason at the beginning of this process was there that Britain had to agree to leave the customs union and uh, the single market. Certainly that wasn't what all Brexiteers said during the... Well, I think there has, certainly on the Conservative side, there is pretty much unanimity, with the possible exception of Ken Clark, um, that we should leave the customs union and we should leave the single market for two simple reasons. The customs union, because if we stay inside the customs union, we can't do new free trade deals with India, China, the USA, and so on and so forth. And if we stay in the single market, we have to sign up to all of their rules, probably still accept yeah. free movement and make budget contributions without any say over those rules. So I think there is unanimity on those points. But look, a bit of negotiation both with Europe and within Parliament is a, is a sign of a healthy and a mature approach to what is a very complicated problem. I think what is unreasonable, actually, is that the Europeans have refused to even discuss trade before these points um, were uh, clarified. And I think it was disgraceful that a few weeks ago, the Labour MEPs in Europe voted against having free trade talks, which is against their own national interest. Well... In some respects, Adam, maybe the government should have taken a steer on this and instead of starting with the money and starting with um, EU nationals, it could have started by saying we want to discuss trade. Actually, the, the staging of all this has been as much set by the UK government as it has been by the European Union. What I would say is this is that we have had, over the last few weeks in particular, um, ardent Remainers basically saying to the Prime Minister, walk away without a deal. I think that is absolutely nonsense. And we have had, on the Remain side, ardent Remainers who really don't want to leave the European Union, also, in some respects, not wanting the best deal possible. I hope, after lunchtime today, we get a sense mm. that we can move forward on EU nationals, on the situation between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, and also on the bill itself. And in doing that, we can start to make some yeah. progress on trade. I, th I, think, well, yeah. I agree. I think we do need to move yeah. forward. Uh, but it was the European Union who refused well, to discuss trade, not us. I mean, there's a fascinating uh, articles, a set of articles in the Financial Times today looking back to the negotiations to get into the European mm. Union. And basically making the point that we completely misunderstood this, that we thought this was a negotiation uh, around the table of bit of give and take, <laughs> whereas, as Pascal Lamy, for example, uh, the French politician, has said, this is just a process of uncoupling. The European Union remains unmoved. Uh, it's just whether or not we want to be part of it and what the consequences of that are. So that there isn't really a negotiation. We keep on talking about a deal and that's been a mistake. Well, I'm not sure I agree with that. I mean, I do think we want, I think Caroline would agree, a close ongoing relationship with Europe that includes cooperation on security, that includes the ability for people who want to move back and forward to work, uh, have them the freedom to do so, 
uh, continue to trade very closely. I think that's in our interests and theirs. And although we are leaving the European Union, I think it's in their interests and ours to achieve that agreement. And I'm hoping today, or what may follow in the next few days, um, is going to be an important step on that road. I am annoyed that the Europeans haven't discussed trade so far, but let's move beyond that positively. Let's start talking about trade and transition as well as everything else, and let's get an agreement reached, a comprehensive agreement that is in their interests and ours. Do you think the Europeans have been unreasonable? Um, look, I think there is a theatre to this, which in negotiation says... You think there is actually something to negotiate? I, well, I do think there is something to negotiate, because clearly we're not going to have the same relationship with the EU. But actually, there's a lot of the areas of EU policy that we will continue to enforce, partly because we introduced it in the first place in some of these areas. So it is interesting, this uncoupling. It's, didn't Gwyneth Paltrow and Chris Martin use that when they were... Conscious, the, conscious, conscious uncoupling. uncoupling going on. So it is about a divorce. Divorce isn't easy. <clears throat> um, um, often there are sound off, and I think that's happened on the EU side, and I have to say by the UK government as well. But it does, maybe, Adam, later on today, there's been more of a sense of progress between both the officials and the politicians in negotiations than the front of house operations would have led us to believe, and I hope that is the case. I mean, it does look as if the real sticking point is, is the Irish border, which, to be fair, was flagged up by the Europeans right at the beginning of this process, not something that was really talked about, certainly on this side of the Irish Channel during the election. Uh, do you see a solution to that? Well, it's very complicated because, and the key thing is not having a physical border because that would upset people in the Republic and it would upset people in the North of Ireland. And of course, you know, the UK is the largest export market by far for people in Northern Ireland, mm -hmm. the rest of the UK, so having a border in yeah. the Irish but, Sea doesn't But if you become either. different trade blocks as you would like by leaving the Customs Union in the single market, there well, really isn't much alternative. Well, well, we're going to have to clearly come up with some very special, very bespoke solution for Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland already is treated very differently to the rest of the UK because it has that unusual status because of the troubles and the conflict, and it'll have to have some special status going forward. I would say, though, that resolving the Northern Ireland customs and trade questions you know, is done most easily in the context of a bigger trade and customs agreement. So I think, if, again, if the Europeans were willing to talk a bit about the wider trade and customs issues, it would make Northern Ireland easier. But let's hope we can find something which satisfies the Republic of Ireland government in the next few days or the next few weeks. Or hours, even. Um, look, I, I think this <coughs> it is difficult, the issue around uh, Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. Interestingly, the Republic of Ireland didn't choose to be part of Schengen, just like the UK. And the reason for that was, was that if they had joined Schengen, it could have led to the end of the common travel area and a hard border mm. between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. Actually, the Republic of Ireland, in good sense, didn't choose to do that. And that always made it very special, the relationship. Mm. The common travel area goes back to the 1920s. And since that time, we've always had, not just in terms of the Ireland, if you like, of Ireland, but also on uh, the UK mm. mainland, a mutual beneficial stance to take to enforce each other's border controls. I hope this can re be resolved. I think there is a willingness to do this. But ultimately, it is about the politicians, once the officials have done the discussions, to make those decisions. And I hope the outcome will be positive today. What do you think the impact of the referendum vote to leave the European Union has been on this country? Um, I think it's been very divisive. I think referendums are often very divisive. And I think some of the language by, to be honest, both sides, mm. both ardent leavers and ardent remainers, have left most of the country feeling quite perplexed and, by and, it. And economically? Well, economically, I think, gained, Adam, it's hard to say. <laughs> Obviously, there was a, an, a, 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 an impact on the exchange rate, which for manufacturers was a good thing, but for others, not so good. The problem is in all this, we have to ask ourselves, to what end does our country's economic future only rely on the EU? Now, I think being part of the EU, I voted to remain. There were benefits of that. But it's quite clear to me, and has been for some time, that the decisions that governments made about our economy in this country has not led us to the sort of highly skilled workforce, the most productive country we can be. And whether we were in the EU or out of it, Actually, those are questions that actually we weren't answering and we need to answer for the future. What do you think the impact's been? Well, I, well, I mean, I agree with Caroline's analysis. I think the biggest challenge facing our economy, actually, is the productivity challenge. And that may have been partly fuelled by very large amounts of cheap labour coming in. So companies, mm -hmm. instead of investing in technology or becoming better managers, have simply hired lots of people. So do you think wages. that drop, for so example, that record drop we saw in immigration, is good news in that sense? Well, I wouldn't view it as good news or bad news. I think clearly um, the country, the people who voted in the referendum, had immigration in mind as a major challenge. And to the extent we can get um, sort of UK people doing jobs here rather than relying yeah. on people coming over in large numbers, the better that is for those UK people. So, but I wouldn't be dogmatic about it and say it's either good 
or bad. Uh, Caroline's right, there is a big world out there beyond the European Union. We need to make sure we can trade with the EU going forward, but also make sure we open our and eyes we, to those opportunities if, that lay around the world. If we look at the reports over the weekend and this morning, Adam, about poverty in our country, one of our biggest challenges is the embedded nature of people who are working who are in poverty. Now, look, Whatever is the situation with the EU, we do know there is more insecure work, more people are, are having the label self-employed when they're not really self-employed, and actually wages haven't risen to ensure that people could make work pay. That's not good enough. And, and you see that as a consequence of what? A no, mass, mass I, 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 migration failed, no, no, no. I think it's a consequence of failed UK policies to support greater skills, but also creating an environment, actually in some cases, not all cases, where I think employers have used flexible working to such an extent, I think it becomes actually working that isn't in the public interest. Well, this is, I think this is where we were getting away from Europe here, but this is where we diverge. But it's diverge. part of our future and well, where we This is where we, need where to we go. diverge. I mean, we are investing hugely in technology, in research right. and development via the budget. Not compared to other countries. And the minimum wage is massively going but up but to help those right. workers on low I just want to stay in Europe, though. <laughs> one, for, one final well, question. Why have wages gone up, then? If They'll things go. move forward, oh, if, if the green light is given, to talks including the future relationship today will that be a triumph for Theresa May or a capitulation by Britain? Well, it certainly won't be a capitulation because we are clear about what we need from these negotiations. Um, it is a staging post on the way to what I hope will become a comprehensive agreement covering transition, future trade, security and everything else. So it's an important step but the deal is a long way from being done. Well, I think, as someone said, it, it's not the end. It is uh, possibly the end of the beginning. And, uh, but George we need, we need to, yeah, exactly. So, but we need to make that next stage of the journey to uh, get the certainty that businesses and the country need. Okay, thank you both very much <laughs> indeed.